I'm a person out there, right? You, work, you reach a certain age and you go through these stages, right? And the stages are you leave your car keys somewhere else or you leave your car somewhere <laughs> yeah. else or yeah. whatever, yeah. right? I think it, that happens to all of us, right? And uh, it, at first it's funny and then maybe it happens three or four more times and you lose sight of the fact that you are of a certain age and you say, I really wonder whether I got a problem. And then, and then I hear this term, Jerry, called dementia. And then I hear Alzheimer's. Is, is, is that what it is? It's memory to dementia to Alzheimer's? So, so the sequence is you know, pretty well known and has been described. Dementia is the general term. It's the whole pie. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's is the biggest slice of that pie as it affects people. But if you're having daily limitations, if you're aware of your memory deficits, if people have said to you, What's going on with your memory? The bottom line is you should seek some type of healthcare evaluation because there might be a medication, it might be depression, it might be other factors that are causing these symptoms. So not all symptoms are absolutely gonna mean you have Alzheimer's, but you have to seek attention if your day-to-day -day functioning is being affected. Okay, so the three of you, bring me from where we were, don't spend too much time on that, where we were and where we are now relative to early detection and then the quality of care of the disease? I think partly this is our understanding about memory and the brain. I mean, the brain is the space of you know, our current century. We, what we're learning about the brain changes minute to minute. Your brain is designed to forget. Do you remember the color of the green room <clears throat> in this studio? The walls are what color? Our brains saw that. We all made a little joke. Oh, it's red in this green room. It's really red. But I'm not necessarily going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not necessarily going to remember that because my brain takes in the sensory information. When I go to sleep at night, it makes a decision as to whether or not I need to keep it or store it or let it go. And it's in those temporal lobes that we actually convert sensory information to memory. The disease starts, we believe, mostly in those areas. So it's in... Uh, although we are not always remembering every detail, some forgetfulness is a totally normal part of any age, and some forgetfulness is also increased and normal for aging. But when, but when do I become concerned? I, I agree with you 100% that we all have this sense that some memory lapses are okay. It's just okay. But at what point in time do I become concerned? So, and I think you mentioned this. Here's the phrase we use all the time, memory changes that disrupt daily life. I can't emphasize that enough. So it is not losing your car keys. It isn't walking out into a crowded parking lot at the holidays and going, where did I park? It's not even going into a room and saying, why did I come in here, which I do. It's dis memory changes that disrupt daily life. So I say to, to family members, if you're going over to your parents' house and you're noticing that there's overdue bills piled up or there's objects that are you know, in the refrigerator that have no business being there, you know, appliances or, or that sort of thing. If you're seeing things out of place or it's July and your parents are wearing multiple layers of clothing and they don't really realize that it's a different season, it's memory changes that disrupt daily life. Well, it might not be that dramatic. Right. It could be more subtle. So I have a patient who is a teacher in a high school and she's a physics teacher and she has noticed over the last three to four months she's having a lot of difficulty getting through the assignments, remembering the formula, stuff that she readily knew. Otherwise, her functioning is okay, but she's very concerned about this. She came for an evaluation, and it does look like she has a progressive type of dementia. So it can be at home, it can be at work, but it can be more subtle than that. The mm -hmm. bottom line is, when in doubt, seek some type of an assessment. And when you say, okay, Jerry, now, when, you, when in doubt, seek some type of assessment, I mean, are you saying that when you're in doubt, you should go see a doctor? Or, and or what you're saying is you could go to organizations like right. Pam and Christy have and seek help there first if you wanted to talk to someone. Is that perfectly we're, we're okay? We're going to send them to the doctor, yeah. though. Right. We're no, no, I understand you're not representing yourself as medical people, right. but you have a lot of but, information, I mean, a lot step. of knowledge. Right. But that's the first step. That's a first step. Right. And then and at some point... Right. At our, our, when people call our helpline, and we last year had about 4,500 people call the Connecticut Chapter Helpline, we will ask some basic questions, and then we will provide resources to a family member that include going to see a physician to get a workup. We do not diagnose on the phone. We do not even, we always encourage people to do this. This is a disease that needs to have a formal diagnostic process. Okay, Jerry, is this curable? 
No. It is not it curable. It is not curable. And that's the issue about the total number of people with the disease. Unlike pneumonia or strep throat, you're treated and it's over. You're not considered in the incidence number anymore. With Alzheimer's, there's no cure. So once you have it, you kind of have it. Okay, so, so I mean, as a layman, I would, the first question I always ask is, is it curable? The answer is no. The next question I would ask is, is it preventable? Can we prevent it? So that's a whole nother debate and a whole nother discussion. Okay, can we, you boil it down for me quickly? Well, we think with certain factors, if there's a genetic predisposition, if you're gonna live to be 95, there might not be a whole lot we can do to mitigate those factors. However, healthy lifestyle, controlling of vascular blood flow risk factors, well-balanced diet, exercise, keeping your mind active, and none of these sound dramatic. It's not like mm -hmm. you're taking a pill, but clearly I think you would agree that the research has shown that that might be the best way to go. We yeah. actually created, um, uh, if you go to our website, agingcareacademy.org, O-R-G, um, on Aging Care Academy, people can click on a dementia risk screen. This is not for your grandparents mm -hmm. or whomever. This is for us sitting around this table. And it's not to diagnose, and it's not even really to prevent, but it's about changing conversations. So last year, my doctor said, Pam, your cholesterol is getting a little borderline. My first reaction is my parents hate their statins. I do not want to be on a statin. But you know what? Alzheimer's does run in my family. Therefore, I have that risk factor. So cholesterol is one of those things that may increase someone's risk of developing vascular mm -hmm. dementia, and depending on what studies you read, maybe even Alzheimer's disease. So it changed my conversation. My conversation with my doctor is, I don't wanna go on statins unless I absolutely have to. What else can we do to manage the cholesterol? Okay. Christy, any any you have any no, other it, comment? No, it absolutely is. I mean, the only other thing that is a preventable risk factor, which we are hearing about more now, are head injuries, yep. and and that's that's you know. So of course, we encourage people to live a safe lifestyle. Helmets. I mean, you you've probably heard and about the studies that the NFL have done. But right. other than that, it's we encourage people. What's good for your heart is good for your brain. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about the audience and the vast majority of them at one time or another are gonna become caregivers. I think Jerry clearly, from people I know who have been caregivers, clearly understated what happens to the caregiver. Yeah, it's a tremendous burden. It's a tremendous burden, so, so amplify it. So we it. know that caregivers go to their healthcare providers more than non-caregivers, and I'm talking about Alzheimer's caregivers there might be some immunological evidences that they're immunocompromised. They miss more time from work and they certainly have higher rates of depression. So when I treat someone with Alzheimer's, I'm treating the whole family. And as I said yesterday to two families, I'm more concerned about the family members than the person with the diagnosis because the impact is tremendous. But we have to make sure that people can avail themselves of these wonderful statewide resources to help reduce that. And it might mean entitlements, it might mean information, it might mean direct care, it might mean respite, but we really have to treat the caregivers as well as unlike any other You know, disease. Jerry, I've, I've had friends who have uh, taken care of their parents with Alzheimer's and uh, to overly simplify, it's broken down into two groups the parents who just have Alzheimer's. And when I say just have Alzheimer's, they have serious memory problems. They can't remember the son or the daughter, that kind of thing. And those who have Alzheimer's who have some other physical mm -hmm. heart, cancer, whatever, and they can't even tell you what it is that's going on with them. I mean, it's hard to take care of someone who can't tell you what's happening to them, right? So yeah. how do they, what are the advice that the three of you have for the people who are watching the show, who are caregivers, I don't want to overly dramatize it, but how do you keep your sanity? Don't do it alone, first of all. Do not do it do alone. Do not do it alone. Some people have this, you know, superhuman complex where they think they can be maintain a marriage, maintain raising children, work full time, and take care of their mother who's 90 with dementia. Seek help. You cannot do it alone and look for the appropriate resources that are available. We Christine? say the same thing, put together a team of people. And that can be su formal supports with bringing people into the home, but it also can be informal supports. You know, tell your neighbors that you are living with someone who has Alzheimer's disease. There could be safety issues. The person could wander. You know, gather as many resources as you possibly can. Attend a support group if, if you want to connect with other caregivers to share ideas, share resources, and, and get help. And, and really.